Yeah, it's a great honor to be the first speaker and a lot of pressures um, that I also have to be on time. Uh, but uh, yeah, this conference is very exciting in that um, we really want to look at the intersection between quantum theory and practice and how, what it takes to really push towards real world uh, application. Um, and today I want to convince you that machine learning and optimization is absolutely critical uh, in, towards this effort. Um, and, um, oh, there's some, so maybe because I use a different app uh, when I make this um, errors offset. Um, and similar thing has already happened in classical computer uh, when we scale from, you know, one or two transistors uh, up to uh, billions of transistors, uh, system on chip, microprocessors. Uh, what happened uh, that really propelled this revolution is uh, so-called electronic design op automation, um, where uh, things are automated, and once automation happens, uh, advanced optimization and machine learning are required to really squeeze out as much as we can as we uh, scale the system up. Uh, unfortunately, we in quantum counterpart are at this stage of a couple qubits, um, far from large scale system. Um, and there are a huge amount of um, research needed to be done in the domain of uh, system design automation, uh, where uh, machine learning and optimization matters. Uh, at the same time, uh, in this effort, we want to discover uh, useful near term applications. So today, I will focus on uh, three aspects of this uh, full stack design. Uh, I will start from quantum architecture, uh, go up one level to quantum control and metrology, and then I'll talk about quantum circuit compilation uh, and discuss how machine learning and different type of optimization methods uh, can help really automate it and, uh, and improve the performance of uh, different uh, aspect. Um, so in this quantum stack, uh, at the very bottom uh, is uh, quantum architecture design. Uh, this includes a very basic thing, such as uh, how we couple the qubits. Um, for example, in Google, superconducting qubit, uh, we have this type of grid-like uh, uh, coupling graph. Um, and then one level higher, we have quantum control, uh, which is how do we engineer the classical analog control pulse to induce ideal uh, quantum dynamics. And then one level higher, once we have the gate, we can implement quantum circuit. We need to optimize them. We need to design quantum application for them. Uh, and every single uh, layer of these can really benefit uh, from machine learning because the fundamental problem is either discrete or continuous or discrete and continuous optimization. Uh, and I will start today from the, uh, the lowest uh, stack, the quantum architecture design. And um, I will give you an example of uh, how that will look like with a superconducting qubits. And uh, this is the type of qubit we use in Google. And more particularly, it's a GMON qubit uh, in that the coupling between the two qubits is realized by in, uh, inserting a third qubit in between through <coughs> capacitive couplings. And the uh, uh, interaction is turned on by moving the qubit frequency close to each other to introduce uh, intermediated coupling. And once we have this hardware, we can lay out the architecture, uh, which is a coupling graph. Uh, and the, uh, the underlying uh, model is very simple. It's just a, a nonlinear uh, oscillator, where uh, a linear inductor, as shown in this one, is replaced by a nonlinear inductor. And this is critical because we want to be able to pick up uh, the lowest two level uh, to realize, uh, to encode quantum information. And this nonlinearity of the uh, unequal separation allows us to really pick them out of infinite many levels. Uh, and the control wires allow us to perform uh, both single qubit op uh, operation and two qubit operation. So based on this uh, hardware, uh, one of the uh, first, the most simple uh, architecture design concern is coupling graph. Uh, coupling graph is, can be uh, described by these two variables of a graph. Uh, a vortex is represent a physical qubit, and an edge uh, between vortex represent the coupling between qubits. So, uh, the, for example, the left side 
uh, uh, architecture in this representation will be correspond to just a simple grid. And uh, we also have, uh, for example, heavy hexagon uh, will uh, architecture used for heavy hexagon code um, uh, will look like this. And on top of that, uh, we can introduce additional flexible couplings uh, represented here by these blue edges, where we can choose to turn on and off uh, based on the application. Uh, and then the goal is to really optimize this coupling graph uh, towards a specific application. Uh, there are many challenges, including uh, there are many uh, realistic costs uh, in regard to adding additional couplings because each coupling introduced corresponds to additional control wires and there, were, there are control crosstalks, additional complexity overhead uh, that make uh, realistic impl implementation much harder. Uh, moreover, it's a fundamentally a discrete optimization, right, where we can decide to either take out or add in a specific edge. Um, and it's hard to derive analytic gradients, uh, therefore it's, um, it's hard to have a very efficient optimization. Uh, moreover, they're not really optimal for near-term application. Uh, for example, this grid uh, used in Google is uh, great for uh, surface code error correction in the long future for fault-tolerant computation. But this connectivity might not be the most friendly uh, for solving QLA, uh, for example, where you want to implement some uh, non-local icing Hamiltonian type of interaction. Uh, and to address this problem, uh, we decided to use uh, a so-called satisfiability module theory. Uh, it, uh, it's a theory that generalizes the Boolean satisfiability problem uh, to include uh, not just the uh, you know, binary variable, but also real numbers, uh, uh, any integers, and different type of data structures, such as lists and vectors. And um, this solver is, uh, can help us address uh, the variable, all these challenges. And I want to point out a specific one, which is uh, the optimality, because when we choose architecture, uh, we really have a huge overhead in the iteration. We cannot afford to change our architecture uh, every single time we have a new circuit. Uh, so we want to be able to provide a provable uh, optimality guarantee. And this is uniquely afforded by SMT solvers. Uh, and moreover, it allows us to incorporate a different hardware-specific cost uh, without any change to the algorithm when you readapt it to different hardware. Um, so let me give you a more specific example uh, of how we can use SMT solvers uh, for quantum architecture <coughs> optimization. Um, so let's start with a specific quantum ap application for number shown by this uh, quantum circuit. The input to this whole workflow will be a quantum circuit and also the quantum architecture space uh, represented by the graph of existing couplings uh, represented by black uh, edges and flexible couplings where we can choose to add uh, into the coupling graph. Uh, and we will uh, process these input uh, to output uh, variables and constraints uh, on both sides of quantum circuit and quantum architecture. Um, and for example, for quantum architecture, well, one type of variable is a Boolean uh, variable that represents if a specific edge uh, is included or acted by the gate or not in the circuit. And the constraints will look like, for example, I have a total number of flexible edges that you should not exceed, and certain edges are not valid. And once we have these variable and constraints, we can apply the powerful tool of uh, SMT solvers, uh, where uh, we, we can perform, uh, do the provably optimal prediction on whether given a certain constraint, such as the total number of edges are smaller than a certain number, alpha, and the circuit depths you want to implement uh, should be able to uh, be not exceed a certain max value. Does it exist a specific architecture that implement this? Uh, and then this iterative linear search uh, will give us a coarse-grained uh, version of how big the quantum circuit need to be to be implemented on a specific a set of flexible edges. And then we send it uh, down to a more fine-grained optimization uh, where we, uh, the idea of uh, the new coupling is to really re in reduce the number of swap needed to route the qubit around uh, in order to introduce non-local interactions. 
So uh, in order to make sure that the whole architecture is optimal, we have to make sure this, the swap count optimization is also optimal. And also we have to do it iteratively, uh, where by adding each edges, we have to decide whether this uh, new edge is worth adding, will it introduce dramatic in, uh, reduction on the swap count. Um, and once we finish this workflow, uh, we have to we, uh, output a specific architecture uh, and logical synthesis result, which is a logical uh, physical circuit mapped from a logical circuit. We have to evaluate um, uh, you know, through uh, additional logical synthesis optimization because we want to be absolutely sure uh, that uh, the type of um, uh, benchmark is not uh, determined by the uh, uh, sub-optimality of the, uh, so the circuit mapping onto the architecture. And, and also, we will need a benchmark uh, metric to determine whether it's good enough. Uh, for example, here we use a fidelity proxy uh, that, uh, uh, that include a single qubit, two qubit gate error, and cross dog errors. Of course, these methods, um, the, uh, the exact choice of benchmark metric can be very flexible and change according to the underlying hardware. Um, so given uh, this is, is, is an example of given a QAOA uh, circuit on 10 qubits, um, where this circuit uh, is shown up here that has uh, quite some non-local two-qubit coupling. Um, we benchmark it under uh, different swap count optimizers, uh, which, as you can see, it matters a great deal uh, which logical synthesis you're using in, uh, in the inner loop of the architecture uh, optimization. Um, An um, important remark is that, uh, in fact, if you uh, account for the crosstalk introduced by adding more coupling, uh, you really don't need to add that many new couplings. Um, and in fact, one, just by adding a single edge in the coupling uh, graph, such as this one, you can dramatically boost your fidelity, overall circuit fidelity, uh, to a factor of two. Um, and moreover, it's transferable in the sense that uh, once you optimize it for a specific circuit in QAOA, you can use the same architecture to, uh, uh, to improve the performance for a, a family of QAOA circuit. Um, so to summarize, the SMT solver, uh, this optimizer really provides us a very useful guarantee to the performance, and it's directly applicable to different type of system and fully compatible with automation. And in fact, it has been used uh, in the classical uh, software verification process and other type uh, genres of electronic automation, uh, uh, design automation. Um, so that concludes uh, the, my first introduction of our quantum architecture optimization. And obviously, there's a lot of work to be done uh, in, in this regard. But I will, because of the time constraint, I will continue to one layer higher on the quantum stack of quantum control and metrology. Um, for quantum control, uh, the underlying problem is uh, to basically optimize a continuous variable analog pulse uh, that will be sent into the uh, quantum system to control a time-dependent Hamiltonian. Um, and in order to achieve certain target unitary evolution at the end of the uh, um, uh, quantum control sequence. Um, the, the main problem for this in reality, in practice, is that uh, there are so many um, realistic imperf imperfections that cannot be modeled by physics. And we also don't have full confidence in who, uh, what they look like, or they are stochastic in nature, uh, which means they change round to round, uh, time to time, uh, in a probabilistic manner. Uh, so because of that, to really incorporate all these realistic constraints in traditional quantum control, means that we will no longer have any provable controllability or closed form solutions. Uh, and we can only afford to put force our way out for a small family of gate, like CZ gate, ISWAP gate. Uh, so if we want to optimize a more flexible range of control, uh, we really need a more advanced optimization method. Uh, and here I chose, we chose the reinforcement learning. Uh, because the underlying problem is the same. It's a time sequential optimization of Markov decision problem. Uh, moreover, the advantage of reinforcement learning is that it allows me to uh, either use a realistic environment 
uh, to do the training where all the imperfection is already there, or to have a simulated environment uh, where we, we can add uh, uh, all relevant noise that can be hard to uh, simulate uh, di uh, directly in regard to the cost function. Um, and uh, so this uh, has been done by incorporating different constraints in the cost function or uh, incorporating them in the simulation. And the underlying problem is the Markov decision problem. Um, and uh, we discovered very interestingly that uh, there are two magnitudes of reduction in the solution uh, of the quantum gate time uh, compared to uh, the traditional uh, decomposition, like if you decompose a two qubit unitary parameterized by this equation into uh, a, a, a closed form, three qubit, uh, three two qubit gates and uh, plus single qubit rotation, so k, k decomposition, uh, this uh, represents this uh, dashed red line. And we saw a, a family of gates that uh, dramatically uh, reduced the runtime. And in fact, uh, later on, we discovered there's some underlying mathematical symmetry uh, that underpins this uh, huge reduction, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, and secondly, uh, we also noticed that uh, the solution is very robust uh, against uh, a range of Gaussian control fluctuation noise, despite the fact that we only train on a specific noise level. Uh, so this uh, type of um, dramatic improvement uh, tell us that there is huge space uh, in applying reinforcement learning in, in quantum control, and we only touched uh, the edge of what we could do uh, with uh, reinforcement learning. And the next topic, I will move on to quantum metrology, uh, where after we have quantum control uh, in a solution, we still want to learn uh, in the actuation if everything is perfect. And the reason it takes three years uh, for quantum supremacy result to public, be published in nature from its theoretical inception is that even a single, uh, a single qubit error uh, happen, it will completely uh, decorrelate the actual output distribution from the ideal one. Uh, so we are extremely sensitive uh, to quantum errors for a lot of applications. Uh, and the dominant air source of error in superconducting qubits, as well as other solid state qubits, is the two level system. Um, they are basically qubits, but we cannot control them, and they can couple to the qubits. Moreover, well, they can move in frequency in real time, either diffusively or telegraphically. Um, and this is bad, because for Google, the qubit architecture uh, is a frequency-controlled uh, uh, gate uh, where we have to move qubit frequency. And we might run into an unexpected two-level system on the way, and uh, once that happens, our whole experiment is done. And so in practice, a human expert always walk in and look at the experimental data and determine to move specific qubit frequency around. And this is extremely limiting because of obvious reasons, human move at a different time scale. And also, we don't have any optimality guarantee, uh, nor is it really truly scalable. So um, instead, uh, uh, we had another alternative method uh, which uh, is friendly to this giant amount of spectroscopy data, data uh, that use a so-called scalable alternative to reinforcement learning, um, and in the sense that it's a much simpler model of reinforcement learning than the one we use for quantum control. Uh, moreover, it, it is friendly to uh, simple, um, uh, large-scale uh, large input, in this case, the input will be uh, billions of points in the spectroscopy data and output a two-level system parameters. And um, it has been shown to uh, improve both the accuracy of the learning, uh, but also uh, the runtime of the learning in regard to automation. Um, so this is another, give you another flavor of how uh, a simple replacement of a human expert uh, can help uh, in the in the genre of quantum metrology. And moving one layer higher to quantum circuit uh, compilation, um, the, it's extremely important, uh, especially for near-term application. Uh, as shown in this uh, diagram, uh, where uh, the y-axis is an amount of um, 
a year it takes uh, the, the, to simulate a specific x axis is a cycle, the depth of the circuit. So if we can keep the fidelity of the circuit the same, deeper circuit means harder to simulate for a classical computer, and which means more practical relevance for a speed up. Um, and interestingly, uh, the, the circuit optimization can again be mapped to a reinforcement learning problem where a different step of the optimization can be labeled in time. So it's again like AlphaGo where we play different moves of optimization and decide what to do uh, for the next move. Uh, and in fact, we did use a model similar to AlphaGo uh, and uh, to incorporate both the hardware uh, hardware specific constraints, but also to guarantee a generalizability in the sense that I don't have to train, retrain the reinforcement learning agent for different circuits. This is guaranteed by the adoption of convolutionary uh, network, uh, where uh, due to the translational invariant uh, part of the network uh, and the encoding of the circuit as an input of a 3D input. Uh, we can train it on any size of circuit and apply it to a different size of circuit. For example, uh, as shown on the left, uh, the, our reinforcement learning agent trained on 12 qubit uh, problem can be uh, used to optimize a 50 qubit random circuit uh, with a performance similar to the best the classical alternative, which is simulated annealing. Um, or we can train it uh, on a random circuit, but apply it to a max cut QLA circuit. Um, so to summarize, um, the machine learning, uh, uh, the machine learning really help us to easily accommodate different type of constraint in circuit optimization, and it help us to generalize uh, the solution, which is hard to do in other brute force um, optimization method, uh, and is compatible with automation. Um, so. To conclude, um, what is really important, I think this conference, most of the people, most of you care about is uh, maybe in, 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 in regard to long-term scale of really fault-tolerant quantum computation. Um, and that's a long way to go, right? We are looking at a chip that size of your thumb and the fridge um, size of this podium versus uh, a ref dilution refrigerator bigger than this room. Uh, and several, uh, many magnitudes of uh, improvement in the size of the system. And so what I haven't touched upon is the quantum error correction. How can we uh, fully incorporate a different type of uh, optimization algorithm and machine learning methods into the design and implementation of quantum error correction in, uh, in interplay with all other three factors of the quantum stack. So I look forward to uh, talk with all of you and uh, think about what we can do in this new field of uh, quantum computer design. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to point out um, also I'm starting in Maryland a computer science department in next fall. So if you are looking for postdoc position or graduate position, please contact me. This is my email. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for great. Thanks for a great tool. Any questions? Hello. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm just interested in uh, have you tuned different neural network for this task, and how much is how how much of the difference does it make? Like if you use the CNN versus some other neural network architectures. And the second question would be because you mentioned TLS in the system, and sometimes from my experience that TLS actually change quite like it's like a random source. And how can your uh, neural network trend at the trend time like extrapolate to the test cases? Yeah. That's, that's a very good question. So uh, just double check. The first question is in regard to this problem. Neural yeah, uh, uh, which is you wonder, have we tried different type of neural network other than convolutionary network? Yeah, yeah so we haven't uh, because uh, 
this has been adopting AlphaGo and it works great. And so we don't see a specific uh, limitation factor in this part of the design. But we did uh, optimize all hyperparameters, including how big convolutional network has to be, uh, learning rate, and uh, et cetera, uh, to make sure it's a minimum model uh, in regard to maximum performance. Yeah, and for two-level system, uh, that's a very good question, which is, uh, uh, as you know, I use a supervised learning to do this type of uh, uh, prediction. So once TRS drift uh, changing property, uh, do I have to retrain? And uh, the answer currently is we have to retrain, but luckily this training is uh, very fast. Uh, in fact, it's implemented in, in this code. It's uh, a ten, just simple tensor operation. You don't even need TensorFlow uh, or any machine learning package. So uh, the hope is it's fast enough for uh, real time uh, or um, not real time or periodic uh, calibration. Yes. Can I just go ahead? Sorry. I'm from here. Yes. Hello. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. How did that get there? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks very much for, for an interesting talk. Uh, maybe just one comment to start. I guess you were talking about the architecture. I was wondering indeed if uh, maybe a graph neural network would be a more, uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, appropriate choice because a convolution, I guess, uh, doesn't really take into account the fact if you, you know, move some gate, you know, the, the uh, circuit should be the same. So this may be just a comment for the future. Yeah. But uh, yeah. my, my question was, um, uh, here you actually use machine learning for optimization, but I guess you, you could also imagine using machine learning for computing the cost function, right? Because I guess yeah. you talked about the, the cost. And so I wonder, uh, you know, how, uh, how important it is to have a realistic cost rather than some maybe proxies, if you have any, yeah. thought, any thoughts on that. Thank you. That's a very uh, good point, uh, which is, this proxy or any other proxy to fidelity will only be relevant if we are working at a very low error li limit where perturbative theory works, right? Uh, or you know, we're working with um, somewhat um, uh, tangible circuit, not extremely crazy circuit where entanglement happen ballistically. Or, um, but so there, there will be regime where we might have to rely on a simulation. Uh, Another reason is maybe there are other errors that's not uh, uh, like uh, it's not digitizable, it's not poly errors uh, that we have to simulate. And this has been the case for surface code. For example, the paper we recently put out, uh, we ha I, I built a crosstalk model and we realized we cannot easily analyze uh, the logical error rate without simulating the whole circuit under you know, four qubit or four qubit unitary evolution. So. Um, there will be cases where uh, full simulation will be needed, uh, but the hope is uh, we are doing this type of architecture optimization for a family of applications uh, where uh, there exists efficient proxy, because otherwise the, this type of iteration might not be very um, efficient. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so I find the uh, SMT approach very interesting. Um, yeah. Have you tried to include uh, fault tolerance constraints into the SMT idea? And if yes, how's it going? Yeah, <laughs> that's very interesting. Uh, I think it will be an interesting direction, um, but I'm aware of uh, uh, the use of SMT in the uh, circuit compilation for fault tolerant uh, circuit. It has been done, but uh, I don't think as it has been done uh, for architecture that's you know compatible with fault tolerant uh, deployment. Yeah, that's a very good direction. Thank you for a wonderful discussion and and, and talk. I'm I kind of have this overarching question, uh, and it has to do with the scaling of these techniques. Yeah. So, in particular, in the architecture optimization. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of, of what it might take or how you might go from what you're doing today to, uh, uh, it's called next, next generation processor, so devices at the 1,000 to 10,000 qubit level? Yeah. Uh, in fact, 
I didn't include a slide on scaling because it will make my talk too long, but uh, you're right, it's actually exponential. Like the runtime of SMT server is, is exponential uh, in the depths, the max depths of the circuit, this T, um, yeah, in, in T, and also basically a number of qubits. Um, so the hope is when you're talking about next, next generation, maybe uh, very close to a fault tolerant uh, scale, uh, we will be able to more focus on error correction aspect. When, whenever it comes to error correction, the code is, has symmetries, translational, uh, invariant, or all type of symmetry. And so the hope is we only optimize uh, for a specific unit of the symmetry, and then it can tessellate the whole architecture. Uh, or if you have certain constraints, say, uh, I will tessellate, but the width will not exceed a certain amount, um, then SMT solver is perfect for that. It can accommodate all type of uh, constraints under discrete optimization. So maybe I could paraphrase that as like the Gidney bot, um, like, <laughs> you know, making what the type of stuff that your colleague Craig Gidney is doing but automated? Yeah, exactly. Something like that? Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much for the talk. That was really interesting. In the bit on Hamiltonian control optimization, you mentioned that after you'd found the solution that performed much better than a human being would, you were actually able afterwards to identify a structural kind of reason why your machine learning solution was so much better. Can, is it possible to briefly say yeah, sure. what that reason is? So you can see this blue one is way lower than other. It takes like two nanoseconds, which is crazy. Where the the uh, blue means the uh, R uh, gamma. There are two parameters, so gamma is close to uh, pi over two. Uh, in that regime, we realized that this two qubit unitary it, be, it become very close to a product of single qubit unitary, just a little bit, a little bit different. Uh, so in that sense, it's, uh, the reinforcement learning agent is able to discover this uh, closeness in, in geometric sense uh, and uh, map it to the control solution. Uh, so this, like, we wouldn't have got guessed otherwise. Thanks. That's really interesting. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Uh, time for one last question, if there's one. No? Okay. Then I, uh, can we thank Murthy again?